In the fall of 1975, Wanda Watkins enrolled at Campbell College. Little did she know at that moment that her collegiate and professional career would last nearly five decades, all of which would be spent in Bowie's Creek. Campbell's first ever female athletic scholarship recipient, Wanda distinguished herself both on the basketball court and on the softball field, so much so that upon graduation in 1979, she was hired as an assistant coach. Just two years later, Wanda was hired as head basketball coach, a job she held for 35 years in a Hall of Fame career. After retiring from coaching in 2016, she moved into the administrative side of the athletics department, where she has served as senior associate AD, senior woman administrator, and interim AD. Coach Watkins will retire in May after 49 seasons of service to the university as a student athlete, coach, and administrator. Her face certainly would appear on Mount Rushmore of Fighting Camel Athletics. My name is Stan Cole, class of 1987, and this is our next installment of Tales from the Creek, where we visit with people who have made this place special over the years. I'm delighted to be joined today by Wanda Watkins. Welcome to Tales from the Creek, Wanda, and thanks for taking the time to visit with us. My pleasure, Stan. Well, Wanda, let's just start at the beginning. How, how did all this get started? What was it like growing up in Johnston County and and uh, and as a kid, and, and how did you get started in, in involved in sports? Well, you know, I did grow up in Johnston County. I was a rural gal, grew up in the country. Uh, my dad worked in the city, but my uncles were all farmers, so I grew up working on the farm and earning money so that we could buy our school clothes and things like that. We... We, we learned really early. I think our parents taught us early, my brother and I, the value of a work ethic. And 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 um, we learned that very early in life. And I've always been appreciative of that. But I grew up in a neighborhood where it was mostly boys. Um, there were a few girls in my neighborhood. So our yard was always full of, of, of young people that were playing either flag football or uh, uh, most times it was basketball and dad constructed a, a court at the house where you know you were able to run under the goal we had it it was b- before the days of goals that you could raise a lower but we had one and we, it was well lit and so at nighttime it was the local place where everybody in the neighborhood in the Cleveland community would come to our house and play basketball so I kind of grew up playing with boys and learning early on that I had to be tough if I was going to do that. And as it grew over time, even when a lot of the boys would, would grow up and get married, them and their wives would come back and play too. So we, it was just a great time all the time in our house. And both my parents were athletes growing up, and both of them loved sports. And so we were constantly going to ball games, watching ball games together, and um, that that's really kind of how it all started. I just grew up being around it and and uh, having a real love for it. Did playing against boys, do you think that stoked your compu- your competitive fire, so to speak? Or? Well, it was tough sometimes, you, you know, and a lot of times some of them were grown men, and so I, I think it was good for me. It, it taught me to I was out to try to show them that I could compete with them. And so it was a fun thing for me. It was something that I looked forward to every night. You know, we'd get out there and we'd play ball, and then my mom would come out, and she'd have cookies or popcorn or something for everybody, and we'd have refreshments, and then we'd go back at it again. And uh, it was just a neighborhood thing that that um, I, I, I do think that with the majority of the people I was playing against were men or young young men. That it was it was good for me because I was always having to try to be at my best whenever I was playing in order to excel against them, which brought out the com- competitive edge in me really early in life. You mentioned um, working around the farm. What were some of the, the the responsibilities you had? What were some of the crops you worked in? Wow, I I used to tell my players these stories about when I was a little girl. I can remember picking cotton all day by hand with a bag that we would wear on our back and and then you would go and you would have your 
your uh, guana sack laid out and you would pour your bag onto the into the sack and at the end of the day whatever your cotton weighed was how you got paid can you imagine you know cotton's not very no. heavy so but I remember doing that as a child and then I can remember when they would collect all the cotton and they would put them in those trailers with the high rails and how we would at, at nighttime how we'd get on those trailers and we'd jump off and turn flips and land in the cotton just having a ball you know making something out of nothing having fun a little competition but we did cotton i chopped tobacco we suckered tobacco i barn tobacco i grated tobacco uh, my dad actually worked in the city but since we lived on the farm kind of next to my grandmother he he had some land and he would he had soybeans and things like that where he had he did he'd plant that and he'd have it turn into hay and he'd use it for his livestock. And I'm sure he helped put me through school doing things like that, where he worked, you know, 40 hour plus week in the city. And then he'd come home on the weekends and do stuff like that to, to help, help us as kids. He was, he was, he and my mom were great providers. And this is, um, you know, these aren't jobs where you're going and sitting in a, in a store waiting for somebody to come in in the air condition and all that. This is physical, tiring, in the heat of the day labor, right? Oh, yeah. You'd get up before the sun would come up and you'd go take out tobacco where you would go to the tobacco barn where the tobacco had, or it had cooked and, and got got ready to take it to the market and you would... Uh, you would take out tobacco, and then they'd take it for the sale. And you always knew if you, if if the tobacco sold good, the farmers' molecules would come back really happy. And uh, that never hurt our paychecks. <laughs> but uh, lots of days we would get up before daybreak and take out tobacco, and then you would, after that, then you would barn tobacco. And you know, did I did all kinds of odd jobs with tobacco where we would grade it. Then we uh, then they came out with the bulk barns later, and so we would put it in racks and put it in the bulk barn. Um, I I vaguely remember as a child where you would bundle it and put a leaf around the top and string it. I never did that maybe one summer or so, um, but that and that's going way way back and more like in the days of my parents where they did that, but. As I grew older, you know, they had the stringers that they used to put it on, and then they would take it up, the, be somebody to hang it in the barn, coming off the stringer. And then later they advanced from that to the bulk barns where you would rack it. And I don't know where they are with it now, but it's it was a, it was a really good life. But like I said, we learned that there was value in working hard, and we took a lot of pride in earning that money. I can remember at the end of the summers after we would finish barning tobacco, how we would go clothes shopping with our money, and we'd come back, and we'd lay it all over our beds, and then we'd invite our friends over to see what we were going to be wearing to school that year. <laughs> so it sounds like you almost had to have floodlights um, in order to play basketball at certain times of the year, because it wasn't like coming home from school and then just go and play until dinner time was it no no and and um I remember one year we had a you know we would have a garden and we would work in the garden with our parents too and we would put food away in the freezer that we would eat on the whole year and we we did that to my parents were very late in their lives um we would have a garden and 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 help them with blanching corn and things like that and I can remember we had a huge freezer where we stored all this food in and then we had a big snow one night and the next morning when we got up our um basically it was a barn burned down with the freezer and everything that was in it the ride lawnmower everything and I was really young at that age and I can remember my mom said to me that I would sit at the window and I was crying and she asked me if I was okay. And I, I was concerned because my basketball had burned. Oh. And there, there our family had lost everything <laughs> that they'd put away for us for the winter. Riding moors, freezers, all that food, all that hard work. And there as a child, and I was sitting there concerned because my basketball had burned <laughs> up in the fire. So 
gives you some idea at an early age how much I loved it. I was into it. Well, tell us, Wanda, you know, growing up, we always pretend to be somebody or, or whatever in the backyard when you're playing or in the, in the driveway. Who were you in the driveway? Who, who were the, some of the players you were imitating at the time or emulating? Well, you know, the, there really weren't women playing on TV then, so you didn't really have a lot of female role models. But I, would, I can remember watching Larry Miller and Charlie Scott, Bill Bunning, Rusty Clark, and, and I remember Larry Miller trying to shoot my free throws like Larry Miller and, and uh, be a point guard like Dig Grubar, who had played for Coach Smith at Carolina. We kind of grew up Carolina fans. And, um, you know, after you'd watch it during the playoffs and the ACC tournament and the NCAA tournament, and then as soon as the games were over, I was out to the backyard. Mm. I was ready to play and put myself in those game situations, you know. I can remember doing it like the nose on my face. It was just it was just something that we grew up loving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and for you know, for me it was a, a baseball player and trying to imitate a pitching motion or mm-hmm. or a or a uh, batting stance in a certain time and then uh you know, it was Tate Armstrong or Pete Maravich or John Lucas in the driveway, um, yeah, I, you know, and trying to and being fascinated with teams that it felt like we heard all about Carolina and State in the early seventies, mm-hmm. and and you know for good reason, yeah. Uh, and then I was fascinated with the teams that played against them, and sometimes uh, you know I wanted to shoot a corner three. It would have been a three point shot, a corner jump shot like Tom McMillan, but I could not get it there left handed like he could. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Those were the days, and. You- we used to, I used to kid with my team after practice when somebody would have a really good practice. I'd say, okay, now so and so is going to be our Holly Farms player of the mm-hmm. game because that's on ACC, the ACC basketball games. It was always the who's the Holly Farms player of the game. They were always the sponsor for ACC back when I was a kid. But um, there really weren't a whole lot of um, female role models. And I can remember the first one of any notoriety in our area. Uh, was Sheila Cotton, and she played at Fuquay Verena High School. And I I can remember uh, going with people from church to watch her play and uh, keeping up with her, and I'll never forget one night I went, and she won't either because Sheila and I are good friends now as we've gotten older, and uh, she coached many years at Lewisburg College basketball and was a, a great softball coach too, but played at East Carolina. But at the time, she was at Fuquay High School, and I can remember going to get her autograph after a game one night, and she was just falling all over herself. She couldn't believe it. But she really was probably the first female role model that I can remember, and that was, you know, when I was in junior high school because athletics in in the county and in the state really went, with basketball, went through a struggle there for a while between the time that I was a uh a senior in or a going from middle school eighth grade to becoming a freshman in high school at South Johnston there was a big movement in the state of North Carolina that basketball was too rough of a sport for women and that there was a big movement to outlaw it and there were some pioneers like Robert Robert E. Lee in the Southern Pines area was one there were others that I'm not that familiar w- with, but I know Robert E. Lee was one who fought to keep women's sport alive. And it was during that time that it went from seven person. It was right around the same time that it went from seven, uh, or excuse me, a six person game to a five person mm-hmm. game. And and when it did that, that I think was one of the biggest turning points that saved the sport because it made made it so much more exciting. And um, from there, you know, we saw all kinds of advances after that. Wanda, some of our uh, of our listeners may not um, remember or have knowledge of the the six player game, mm-hmm. um, three on one side and, and three on the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, when you first started playing organized basketball um, uh, with girls, it, it was the it, explain that a little bit to us. Okay, I was in the seventh grade at the time, and 
at the time that I played, it had advanced a little bit. I think there was a day where it was like three at one end and three at the other. But by the time I started playing it, there were two players who were called roving forwards, and they got to play the entire floor. They played offense and defense. Then there were two players that played offense with them called forwards who would play offense with the roving forwards when they would come down to their half court. Mm -hmm. And then when the other team got the rebound and went back the other way, the forwards would stop at half court and the stationary guards who were at half court waiting would be defenders. So you really had specialists back in those days. You had two players that were pretty well-rounded that would play the whole floor, two that played offense with them, and two that played defense. So it was an entirely different game. And then that was my seventh grade year. And then my eighth grade year, the state of North Carolina went to five person. And that's when things really started to pick up and change for the better, I think, for the sport. And then, you know, after that, then we got the smaller ball. The, the um, Of course, there was a 30-second clock for women when I got to college. That had already preceded me, so I don't know about the time that that evolved, but then the small ball came afterwards, after I got here, and then the three-point arc, and uh, now we have all kinds of things like advancing the ball and things like that that have been added to the sport. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the people that that helped you along the way, Um, Mm -hmm. your coaches, um, teammates, relatives, and stuff that that helped you. um, Yeah prepare uh, to go play college basketball? Well, I think my parents were instrumental because they worked hard to provide the things for me that I needed in order to do that. Now, I never was a basketball schooler. I never went to camp because I was always working in the summers uh, with my uncles. And uh, so I never I never really attended camp uh, until I got to, to, to Campbell and then I started working camp. Um, but there were so many people along the way, uh, first and foremost, my parents, and then my brother always, I think, made me tough because we were 27 months difference in our age, and we're still pretty close today. Um, but we, you know, he was good competition for me, too. And then I was fortunate. I had good good uh, middle school coaches in Larry Bowman and Bill Jordan, who were very good to me. And then Bill, when I went from middle school to high school, Bill Jordan went to the high school as well for uh, my first year. And he was my coach in the eighth grade. And then he was my freshman coach. And, and, um, And so I was fortunate that I went to a school like South Johnston. That was, we had the pioneers like Bruce Coates, who were very instrumental in the athletic development in Johnston County uh, with baseball, with our entire school and the athletic program. They, they just did things really well at South Johnston. So it, it, when I first got there, we didn't have a gym, but they were building it. So my freshman year, we played in Four Oaks. We practiced in Benson. We played in Four Oaks. And you've probably heard me tell the story before. My mother drove uh, 25 miles to take me to practice, 25 miles back to fix dinner for our family, 25 miles back to pick me up, and 25 miles to take me home every single day so that I could play high school basketball that year. So, yeah, I've always been grateful for that. And um, and and so we then we got the gym, and, the re- of course, the rest was history then. And um, we were pretty we – were, we were pretty successful – uh, my junior uh, year, let's say '74, we were state champions, and and then we thought my senior year we're going to turn right around and do it again, but we we lost out that year. But we went the year before, I guess my sophomore year, we were we we got put out in the regionals, uh, but but my junior year we were really successful, and Tom Jackson was our coach, and we just had a. A, a nice uh, 50 year. It's been 50 years since we won the state championship. We had a 50 year reunion back in um, January, January 19th this year, and it was it was great. Everybody on our team came back, with the exception of one person, and we lost a manager that passed away early in life. So Tom Tom Jackson, who coached us, was there, and um, still South Johnston. You know, they just treated us like queens. It was a great. Um, 
get great gather and great recognition for us that night, and the gym was completely packed when we um, walked out at half at, at uh, halftime of the game. So they they just always did things really well there. It made me proud to be at a school like that, um, and they they continue to do that. So uh, long long about that time, I was being recruited some. David Frazier was the president at Peace College at the time, and Dr. Frazier took a big interest in women's athletics. He would come to my games and write me letters, and Norlin Finch was coaching there at the time. And then um, Robert Doak was the coach at NC State. He preceded Kay Yow. It was the year I graduated the year before Coach Yow started at NC State. But I, I can remember getting a letter from Robert Doak where he he laid it all out and told me the only thing I'd have to pay for if I went to NC State was I'd have to pay for my room key. Mm-hmm. And I I didn't want to go because I wanted to be a physical educator. I knew I wanted to be a coach, and they didn't have that major at NC State. And a lot of people thought I made a big mistake by not going there, but I think it was one of the best decisions of my life, you know, because the rest has been history for me here at Campbell. Absolutely. What oh, – what – um. I mean, obviously, the proximity, just, you know, 11, 12 miles away from Benson um, and, and you know, in the neighboring county from where you grew up. Um, what was it about Campbell that, um, aside from having that physical education mm-hmm. um, major, uh, drew you here? I think that was the biggest thing was the fact that I knew I wanted, by that time in life, I knew I wanted to stay involved in athletics and I knew I wanted to coach. And I, I had worked... Um, when I got to college here, I worked in recreation a few years at, in Raleigh with the Parks and Recreation Department. It just wasn't something that appealed to me, and I, I was, so I was glad that I, I came to Campbell so that I could teach and coach. And um, Coach Peabody was the coach here, and uh, she recruited me, and Wendell Carr was the athletic director. And they really took a chance on me at a time where women's athletics was just starting to provide scholarships, and and so uh, a lot of people say, well, you were the first full scholarship recipient at Campbell. No, I, I was not. I was not a full scholarship recipient. I got a little money for basketball. I got a little money for field hockey, and then the rest, I had to go out and work and officiate uh, games. I would go to uh, Raleigh to the Cap 8 in, in that conference and officiate volleyball twice a week to help earn some spending money. And bless my parents' souls. I mean, you know, they were so good to me uh, coming up with that extra money that I needed to attend the school and, that I wanted to be at. But it was close to home, and I could run home and have a meal with my family. Uh, and yet I was far enough away, I kind of felt like I got got away from home. But I don't think it was until I truly got away from home, if you would call 30 miles away, getting away from home that I really appreciated the finer things in life. When I got to college and I saw how other people were, they weren't fortunate to have families like I had and uh, they weren't provided for like I was. You know, it made you really appreciate those things. Absolutely. Wanda, I can't imagine having the president of a, of a college sending you a letter, um, want, you know, taking interest in you, wanting you to come uh, pursue your academic and athletic career, career there. Um, and it's kind of hard to think of that as even being part of the equation even now. Um, you know, we hear about, uh, you know, some of the recruiting visits and some of the inducements, and now there's NIL. Um, you know, what was Campbell like in 1975 when you set foot on campus here? It was an entirely different looking place. The Even Carter Gym looked nothing like it does today. It was, there weren't nearly the number of dorms. The athletic facilities were nothing like they are today. And yet it was the same kind of atmosphere that it still permeates today. It it was a down-home kind of place where people loved you. They cared about you. They took a special interest in you. They wanted to see you do well. And it was a big difference maker for me at the time in my life. I'm not sure I would have survived on a campus like NC State. Looking back on it now, 
uh, I'm just so grateful that I that I picked Campbell. But this wasn't. It was just. It, it it's hard to describe how different it was, in terms of aesthetically, mm-hmm. compared to how it is now. To me, today we almost look like a little mini Wake Forest, mm-hmm. and back in those days, in a lot of ways, you know, our high school gym might have been bigger, uh, as South Johnston than in Carter, but then when you put the crowds that we would have in Carter in Carter it was a great atmosphere and it and it was fun um I can remember um people coming in for games when they would come and recruit uh, we would bring a recruit to campus I can remember the families how their mouths would fall open when they would you know we'd barely make it to a game uh, for the men, when we were recruiting, we'd take them to a men's game, and their mouths would fall open when they get there to see the number of people, or when they would come to one of our games later, and they would walk in and have to be escorted to find a seat in Carter. You know, those were those were things that were fun, and there were there were great and fun times. You know, when I came to school here, I I have friends that I de- like uh, that I develop friendship people folks that I develop friendships with that are still great friends of mine you know 40 50 years later and uh we had we had fun we had fun and and it was all about the love of the game playing for the love of the game and uh just enjoying it when you did it it it, it was just it's just a, a different time, a different generation, just totally a different place. You mentioned wanting to major in physical education and 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 go into coaching. Um, who are some of the uh, Betty Jo Clary, Francis Lloyd, some of these, some of your your teachers and uh, the, the coaches from other sports? Tell us a little bit about um, you know what you learned from your mentors here. Well, I learned so much. I shared my early coaching days, I shared an office with, with Betty Jo Clary and Francis Lloyd, two Hall of Famers here. And I, I, I just, you know, I just took it in. I mean, there was just so much I learned just by listening to those ladies who had been there and done it for so many years. They had so much experience and they could bring me back to reality sometimes if I'd get on my high horse or something. And we shared an office there in the end zone of Carter Gym next to Danny Roberts. And Coach Clare was a great teacher of the game, but she was just a great teacher of the game of life. And and uh, Miss Lloyd, you know, pretty much resurrected our tennis program here at Campbell and was fantastic with that. And everybody wanted to take a class with Miss Lloyd, you know, because she was just such a caring person. And I had Danny uh, Roberts. I had Danny for golf, one of my golf classes, and I fell in love with golf when I had Danny. And he said he would say to me, "You know, this could be your sport. This could be your sport." He wouldn't be very proud of me now if he saw me play, but but I enjoyed it and I learned a lot from him. And uh, Coach Peabody was a competitive badminton player. She played competitively and she was good. She could beat anybody that stepped out onto the court and that was something that I developed a love for and later in my life I played a lot of badminton uh, and tennis uh, I, I in fact I like tennis so good I, I began to skip class to play tennis and it got me in a little bit of trouble when I was a freshman but uh, she she again was a great teacher too and I uh, you know I, I, I learned so much from those folks and Dr. Dr. Williams was our our president and, uh, you know, would come to all of our games. Coach McCall was at all the games. Uh, those, Frank Up Church was a person that helped me. And as I began to my coaching career and and try to advance the program, I would, I would go to Frank and he would have a listening ear and help try and help me do the things we wanted to do in the program. He would try and help me get there with it and just... Uh, gosh, I could go. I could just go on and on and on. I mean, I worked with some 
with some great coaches. You have uh, B.J. Cleary. I, I was assisted with her. And then Danny worked in his basketball school when he was doing the basketball school, then worked alongside Billy Lee, Robbie Lang. I mean, it's just uh, I've, I've been around some quality people over the years, and I've always tried to learn from everybody that I was around and exposed to the game because what's always amazed me is that different philosophies and different ways of doing things and yet people can still be successful and so I've always just tried to take a lot of that in and learn different ways of doing things and try to be creative about teaching the game and the game of life with kids. Wanda you mentioned um, uh, a story you shared with me back a couple months ago in uh, 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 this year's Hall of Fame inductee, Barbara Fox, who was a teammate of yours. And uh, uh, you told me about uh, the fact that uh, she was incredible in martial arts and that she could jump up and kick the chandelier in the lobby of Treat and Dorm. <laughs> Tell it, share that. with What was that like to see? I mean, and, and Barbara's about five foot eight maybe yeah about five four five five yeah. probably yeah no again that's one of those longtime friendships mm -hmm. with someone that we were in the same dorm in college we played on the same team and fox was small but mighty you know she was a tremendous uh softball player and 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 still is so talented and so strong such a physically strong athlete but um yeah fox was she was into that and and was good at it, and uh, we were there. We were all of us were there in the same dorm. None of us really went home. We'd go home for a little bit and then come back on the weekends. And we had a, a big pool table down in the bottom of Treat Dorm, and we'd play pool on you know till lit, wee hours in the morning. We'd all get down there and play pool and just have a good time. And and a lot of us still are in touch. Uh, with each other, but it was good to see Barbara uh, go into the Hall of Fame. She's definitely a worthy, worthy candidate, a tremendous athlete here. Wanda, what what do you think, especially in those formative days um, uh, before Campbell moved to Division One, um, you know, women's sports? If you if you think about in the decade between middle school and when you graduated from college. Mm -hmm. Three on three basketball to scholarships, and then, and then, less than a decade later, Campbell's Division One mm -hmm. and, and basketball. What what were the strides that you saw in um you know within the program within within the game? Yeah. Well, when I first came to college, we were in the AIAW, mm -hmm. which was Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, and everybody was lumped in there together. So it wasn't uncommon at all for Campbell to play state and beat them in basketball. Mm -hmm. There was a, It wasn't very lucrative for women then. Everybody was lumped into the AIAW. And then as the NCAA started to recognize championships for women, then Power Fives like NC State and Carolina and those guys moved into the NCAA where there were more opportunities for women. It was more lucrative. Uh, and then at the time we moved from AIAW to NAIA for a few years and I should have dug up all my notes because I have this somewhere when I used to go and speak to different women's groups here in town and would tell them about the history of sports here but we were NAI for a while and then I can remember going as a coach I believe my first year we were First year or two, we were in the NAI District 26, and then we went from NAI to Division One. And I can remember our first year in Division One, we won 19 games. And thinking at the time, we were scared to death because we didn't know what what it might bring. But it it was such a different era from then to now. There were you were, we were just beginning uh, to see women be given those opportunities, and, and all that started when the NCAA recognized championships for women. And I, I know you've heard me tell this story before, Stan, but I can remember my first Final Four 
going. I, my first Final Four was in 1989, and I flew. Uh, we won our first championship, and I can remember um, talking to someone at the university, and they thought that I should be able to go out to the national convention, particularly since we had won our championship that year. And uh, so I flew out to Tacoma, Washington, and I was just overwhelmed at how the sport was beginning to grow. Uh, the number of photographers that were at events and just it was on a national platform with television and things starting to come along. And um, I can remember the first Final Four that I went to where I sat down in a game and a little girl came and sat down in front of me and had on a Rebecca Lobo jersey. And that's when it really hit me that now these little girls have female role models and things are really beginning to change now. And now you look at even from then to where we've come now. I, I remember in 2000 when we went to the NCAA tournament and we played at Duke. I can remember Brian Bowman coming to interview me when we got there. He was with um, one of the stations in Raleigh and I can remember when he came and interviewed me, but that was the extent of it. We played in the national tournament and made school history, and we our game was not televised. That was, and then, then the next year it wasn't televised at all, in part or anything. It wasn't televised at all. And then the next year after that, in two thousand one, they started televising the four region games even in the first round, but they'd go from one to the other where you saw a little bit of each one of those games. And now, of course, it's all televised. And even like the WBIT, some of that will be televised now this year. And and so it, 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 I think that the exposure that television brought to the sport was vast. Uh, I think scholarship opportunities at the time when I came in 75, uh, being the first female recipient of a partial scholarship uh, to it being everything being fully funded now, and scholarship opportunities, TV opportunities, the media. Now you have the Caitlin Clarks of the game, the Angel Reese's. You have... Um, you have those kind of players like a Caitlin Clark where I saw yesterday when their, the bracket came out that within 30 minutes they sold every one of their tickets for the first round game in less than 30 minutes. Uh, that is huge. And the sport is really growing in notoriety now. And I think we may see the same thing happen in the WNBA when she makes that move in there next year. And because because she's so well-known now and people are following her. But I'm rambling, but I, I, I just think it's it's like night and day. Without a doubt. Wanted well, to take us back, 1979, you're graduating. Um, were you thinking about teaching high school, coaching high school? Tell us how it turns out that, you know, you transitioned from, a, a, you know, college senior to, in a couple months later, you're an assistant coach. Yeah, I was, I was working with the Raleigh Parks after I graduated. I worked with them in the summer months, and I was working with the Raleigh Parks, and I can remember my dad picked me up one day for lunch. He worked in Raleigh as well, and I told him, Dad, uh, I really, I, I don't think I want to coach in high school right now. I think I want to go back and get my master's. And at the time, Coach Clary had already get, given her grad assistantship to Coach Candy Fox, who was one, one of my longtime friends, became one of my longtime friends. And so I, I, I told Coach Clary, and Coach Clary let me come back, and I helped her for for basically for free that year, and I would work on the sides, and then my parents helped me again. My parents helped me again come back and work on my master's that year, and then, and then the uh, the next year, Candy graduated, and 
I got the grad assistantship. And then the next year, Coach Clary decided that she was going to get out of coaching and just be a full-time teacher. And so Candy and I both competed uh, for the job, and we were best friends. You know, we coached together. And um, I think Campbell, I, I got the opportunity to come, perhaps, probably because I was a Campbell grad, undergrad and grad, had played here was familiar with the place. Um, nonetheless, I got the job, and I can remember the first person to, to campus that night to congratulate me was Candy Fox. So we, we remained the best of friends, and then she went on to Clinton High School, and she coached uh, Tanya Caldwell, Tanya Sampson, uh, Danielle Parker, all those gals, and won all those state championships at Clinton and just developed a dynasty down there. And... Uh, we remain friends until her death, and uh, so I'll always be grateful to Candy for supporting me so much, you know, when she found that I got the job. A lot of people would have lost their friendship over that. Um, Honda, what, what was it like when your February of 1979, you're in the huddle, you've got the uniform on, your teammates, you're on the on the bus or in the van with the team and, and in the cafeteria. And then fast forward to October 5th, the following October 15th, and then you've got the whistle around your neck. Yeah. Uh, with, and and many, of, many of the players on the team would have been your teammates six months mm -hmm. later. How did you make that transition from peer to coach? It was it was a little bit hard at the time but again my friends like uh Rhonda Rhonda Johnson Rhonda Muller at the time um who were were you know good friends of mine I played my senior year with them and they were freshmen Rhonda and Cindy Cindy Parker Cindy Biggerstaff those 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 gals were you know they were freshmen and I was a senior and then the next year I was coaching them it was uh they were better they were better about it probably than I was. It took, it was a transition and I just had to, I knew that I wanted a career in coaching and that I was going to have to draw a line and that I could no longer just be their best friend. I had to be a, per, a little bit of a person of authority. And, and so I, I drew the line and along the way, I lost a few friends that ended up coming back once they grew up. And, and, and so you you wouldn't see that happen now. Again, it was a different era. It was a different time in women's athletics. I uh, probably wouldn't see somebody become a head coach at the age that I did, 21 years old or whatever I was at the time. So, um, Especially in an established sport like basketball. Yeah, yeah. The, the field hockey player at UNC that's the national player of the year and then hired immediately and then leads them to the national championship as a 23 year old this yeah. year or whatever. I mean, that, yeah. that's just, that is yeah. unheard of, but it's not too far off what Campbell, how they invested in you. Yeah, I, I, I remember talking to Wendell Carr when the job, when Coach Clary decided to go into full-time teaching, I can remember talking to Wendell Carr and going to his office and saying, you know, would you think I was crazy if I applied for this and he, he told me, he was like, no, you're the person we want in this position. And that, you know, he had so much faith in me. Um, never forget it. Hey, and he gave me my first job here as well. Yeah. So um, it's, it is not, um, no. it's not, there are so many people that have come through here that have treated us like their own um, and that it's been up to us yeah. As time has grown to try to somehow step into some of their yeah. their um we, their shoes. We uh, say it all the time, you know, we are the Wendell Cars, the B. J. Clary's, the Harry Larshes. We are those people now and our students here. And they have to be. This concludes part one of our conversation with Wanda Watkins. Join us in two weeks on Tales from the Creek when we continue our chat with Campbell Hall of Famer. Wanda Watkins.